I believe with all my heart that God is in the business right now of raising up praying churches across the earth. Let me tell you what I told the first service. The days of Sunday only Christianity are over. That's going to be disruptive. Do you know Jesus began his ministry and he ended his ministry by cleansing the temple in Jerusalem? He began it in John 2, and the disciples said, My goodness, Jesus looks like his grandfather, David. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And then in Matthew 21, at the end of his ministry, when they're waving the palm branches, and they go, Hosanna to the son of David, he comes in as the son of David, he cleanses the temple, and it says the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them there. See, I believe that the zeal of Jesus is being restored again in his people. And this is going to be very disruptive because it's going to remove all of the stuff that has stood in the way between God and intimacy with his people. It's going to be disruptive because it's going to expose leaders that have stood in the way way too long and built things around them. That have built it around their personality that have built it around their gifting. God's raising up friends of the bridegroom in this hour who are going to introduce the bride to the bridegroom and learn how to get out of the way. Who are going to connect a generation to their God. That's the kind of leadership that God is raising up. I want you to turn to Luke 11. And I want you guys to pull on this. You can turn that back on. Let's go again. All right, good, good. We are in the middle of a great shift in the earth. The earth is in transition. 2020 was the great statement. I want to say this to you. We're never going back to life as we knew it before. We've, you know, I, I, I want to get rid of the mask, and I want a lot of things to go back to normal. But there are certain things that I believe that will never go back because we're entering into a new season. And hear me. Jesus called this in Matthew 24. How many mamas in here had babies? Come on. I've sat by four births. And when you try to, and we've sat by four births. I have three beautiful daughters. I have a son who's in heaven. And, and, we, and I sat by four births. And we sat there in those contraction seasons. When those contractions begin to set in, they're wide at first, but they're quicker and quicker and quicker leading to the full birth. And Jesus likens the end times to the, to the contractions and the birth pangs that come upon wo a women in giving birth to children. And he says, birth pangs are going to come upon the whole earth and it's going to culminate with the great birth, which is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's going to birth in a new age. It's going to birth in a, the kingdom of God in the earth. The earth is being prepared right now and the church is entering into a wineskin shift. We are in the midst of a wineskin shift. And what it's going to prepare for is the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the earth has ever seen. We are going to see Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit poured out on all flesh. Sons and daughters prophesy. Young and old, men and women, blood, fire, vapor, smoke, sun into darkness, moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. God's going to release a great outpouring before his coming. But you need to understand, I, I, I want to tell you, a billion soul harvest. A billion soul harvest. Hundreds of millions of new converts flowing into the kingdom. The power of God hitting whole regions as whole regions come underneath the manifest presence of God. The spirit of conviction rests on a whole city to where there cannot be one human trafficking ring, not one pedophilia ring, not one human, tra not one prostitution ring, no drug trafficking through this region because of the manifest spirit of conviction. That's what's in my heart. I'm not talking about good services. I'm talking about regional and national takeovers of the spirit of God. But you must understand that when revival really comes, it's going to disrupt everything. A lot of us just think, we get revival, church won't be as boring. 
You got to understand that when real, when real revival breaks in, it disrupts all the systems. Ephesus wanted to kill Paul. What revival does is it removes the gray areas in the heart of man and it becomes extreme love for God and extreme hatred for God. And there's a mystery called the mystery of iniquity where men love darkness in the face of blinding light. And we are going to see great rage of Satan, the sin of man, the judgments of God as God prepares the earth to bring forth the bride that will come forth out of this in full partnership with Jesus. And we will see the breaking in of the kingdom of God. And what is God doing right now? I'm letting you know where we're going. It's important that you understand where this is going. Are you with me this morning? Well, then talk to me. Okay, you can talk to me. Right now we're in the middle of a shift where God's bringing us back to apostolic foundations. He's bringing us back to apostolic foundations. Apostolic foundations of God's the first one that we minister to. God's, God's, we minister to God before the poor. We minister to God before the lost. We minister to God before the sick. Everybody gets ministered to but God. God's the last one in the room. And yet that's the apostolic foundation is first commandment, first place. Loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And the second is the overflow of the first. And we just assume because we're at church, the first is in first place. The, usually the first is about 10th place. But it's all changing it's all changing. And what's happening? God's restoring gardens at the heart of his church. Do you know the first thing that God did after creating Adam in the garden? Adam, he planted a garden. And he put Adam in the garden. And he says, Adam, this will be the place that I will come meet with you. The Lord will first build the place of encounter. And that will become the place from where man rules in the earth. God is planting gardens back at the heart of the church. Because Jesus did not die for 45 minutes and 20 bucks. So we could live the other six days and 23 hours of our weeks disconnected. Jesus died to rend veils. He died to bring us who were afar off into deep intimacy with him. I quoted a verse in the first chapter in the first service out of Isaiah 56 where God invites the sons of the foreigner. I want to tell you something about God. He's issuing an invitation for everyone to come to him in the place of prayer. And if you're really messed up, I'm talking about really jacked up, you especially qualify. If you can't believe some of the things you did in 2020, you especially qualify. There is a royal red carpet being laid out to all of us in this hour. And the father saying, kids, it's time to come on home. The father's house is the house of prayer. Father's always running out. He'll run out to younger sons who have been in Vegas partying. And then he'll run out to older sons who have been in seminary trying to be perfect. And the Father's inviting all of us into the house. I can hear the Holy Spirit saying, kids, it's getting late. It's time to come on in. Most of us are living in the front yard of Christianity. You're made to live from within the house. We're in the middle of a great shift. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. I'm here to tell you that joy is going to fill his house. I want you to look with me in Luke 11. Let's go. Let's just go ahead and skip up to verse 36 of chapter 10 before we look at it. Let's go ahead and stop that. Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us right now. 
I want to connect Luke 10, 36, and then we'll go into Luke 11. The short of the story is this. Jesus comes into a town called Bethany. It's about a little bit south of Jerusalem. Jesus is going to come into Bethany, and there's going to be two sisters. One's name's Martha, and the other one's name is Mary. Jesus comes in hungry, and Martha immediately begins to prepare a meal for Jesus and the disciples. And it says this verse in Luke 10, 39. It says, but she had a sister. Let's read this in Luke 10. I want you to see this. It says, now it happened as they were, they entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary. Here it is. Who, she had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she looked at Jesus and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Here's the moral of the story. Learning how not to miss the window of opportunity. Learning how to take advantage of the moment. The majority of believers in this hour are bound and we worship the God of busyness, the God of distraction, the God of anxiety. And we are so busy running around, around the stuff around Jesus that we ne actually never sit at his feet and encounter him. I'm talking about services like this. I'm talking about the machine of ministry. Busyness in the church. And we're busy and we're blessing. And we're changing the earth. We're changing Zoom. We're changing Facebook and YouTube. We're changing the world. Yet we're so busy around Him, we're not actually looking at Him. We're not actually connecting to His heart and letting Him transform us. And Mary does the most revolutionary thing in the world. And I believe Mary is a prophetic sign to the church in this hour. Can you come out of the swirl around Jesus and find yourself at his feet with a Bible open, your mouth closed, and you hearing his words? Have you learned how to sit down, shut up, and let him talk first? Have you learned to prioritize a time and a place that no devil in hell can talk you out of, no amount of money or opportunity can get you out of, no amount of mistreatment or betrayal can get you out of, but that it's the holiest moment of your day is at his feet and hearing his word. I'm here to tell you, and I want to just prepare you for this. I'm going to say it to you. I'm going to say it to you. I'm going to say it to me. The devil will let us get lots of big churches. The devil will let lots of big things going on. You want to put hell on notice? Find yourself on your knees with a certain time allotted to God every day and nothing talks you out of it. And do, show up there for the next two decades every day. That's what will put hell on notice. She sat at his feet and she heard his word. And this is what happens. Mary made setting at Jesus' feet her primary reward. If you make what you do for Jesus your primary reward, hear this, I'm about to prophesy to some of y'all. It's not about Mary versus Martha. We need both. I need sandwiches. Somebody just made a real nice cheesecake upstairs. I loved it. If we just had a bunch of Mary sitting around praying all the time, I would not enjoy that. So thank you. Thank you. It's not about Mary versus Martha. It's about Mary before Martha. You're not hearing me this morning. Can y'all talk to me? Can y'all talk to me? I'm not going to just endure you for the next 30 minutes. It's not about Mary versus Martha. It's about Mary before Martha. That your primal, your primary source of identity is not what you do for God. 
It's not what you do for God. It's who you are to God. And if you don't settle that, if you don't settle that your primary calling, Bible open, heart open, no videos on you, nobody watching and nobody caring, and you fall madly in love with him away from the eyes of men, if you make that your primary reward and the words that come out of his mouth your definer, God will begin to birth works out of you that will change the world all around you. But if you don't learn that spot first, hear me, you'll turn into making what you do for God your primary reward. And you'll always feel like you're getting the short end of the stick. The leader will never recognize you like you think you need to be recognized. You'll begin to get angry saying, look at how much I've done. Look at how much I've served. Nobody's done any of this. I'm here before everybody. I'm here after everybody. See, this is the thing about Martha. She's aware of Mary. And she begins to question Jesus' fairness. Jesus, you're not fair. I'm working my tail off for you. Don't you care? See, this is the thing about Mary. When you make him your primary reward... You're unaware of everything else and works flow out of you. And you're not looking for Jesus to pay you back because he's your payment. His words is your reward. A Martha, a true Martha that has come through the door of Mary can work for decades with nobody paying attention, nobody noticing, and nobody patting you on the back and you walking around with a glad spirit. Because I don't get my reward from Vlad noticing me. I don't get my reward from Lana noticing me or that life group leader noticing me or for them seeing what I've done. My reward is him and what he says over me. That's the shift. And when God's words become the loudest and become the definer of your life, you can serve for decades with a glad spirit. And you come out of the swirl of distraction. The swirl of anxiety. And the swirl of busyness. And the majority of the church, we love meetings. We don't really know what to do with him. When it's me and him alone, a Bible I barely know and a God I barely know. And I've got to go on the journey of boredom and dealing with my boredom with God alone. And we are all going on that journey. What do I do? What do I say? Well, I think it begins with you not talking. I'm about to give you your first lesson in prayer. God talks first. Does anybody like being in here with somebody who just talks all the time? Husbands, keep your hands down. Wives, keep your hands down. What, what relationship is there when one person owns 99% of the conversation? Prayer is not monologue, it's dialogue. And it begins with the words you've heard. And Mary did the most revolutionary thing. I refuse to miss this moment. The Son of God is in my house. The Son of God's in my house. Let's fast forward. I, I wasn't going into this. I was going to do Luke 11. Get my teachers to pray book. It's, it'll change your life. Fast forward. The next time we see Mary and Martha, where was it? It was John 11. The death of their brother Lazarus. Okay? This is amazing. John 11. The report gets to Jesus. Jesus loved these guys. Report gets to Jesus. Your friend Lazarus is sick. Okay, And it says in John 11 that Jesus loved them. And he says, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. And it says, now Jesus loved them. So he stayed where he was two more days. If you loved them, Jesus, why didn't you translate to Bethany and heal him? 
What is it about Jesus let, knowing that him not getting there in time is going to let Lazarus die? So Jesus tells us what he's going to do from the beginning, but he lets the story play out. And he's going to let realities come forth out of Mary and Martha's heart that I believe are connected to the Luke 10 season. And because Martha did not learn to find the glory of the moment when Jesus was in her home, she lived constantly by the swirl. Whatever the recent circumstance was is where her emotions were. Whatever crisis was going on in her life, she just lives from crisis to crisis to the kids to house to money to this to that, and they live by the swirl. And when crisis hit their life, and, and they know Jesus got the letter, but Jesus let him die. And now what you going to do about that, girls? That's the furnace. Have you ever cried out to God for something and the thing you wanted the most died? The breakthrough you needed from God died. It didn't look like what you thought it was going to look like. And Jesus shows up in John 11 four days late. What happens when Jesus is four days late? Now, we all know he's not late. It's perfect timing. But he's late. <laughs> he's late. What happened in the heart? It says in John 11 that Martha's pacing. In, I just see her pacing in the room. Where's he at? He said he's going to be here. I know he got the letter. He should have gotten here on time. But it says this. Mary was sitting in the house. Mary's sitting again. Martha's pacing. And it says this, that as soon as Martha heard, so now Jesus has come into Bethany. He's on the outside of Bethany. And it says, as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was at Bethany, she bang, she left. She runs to Jesus and she looks him right in the face, standing up and looking at him. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now get a hold of this. But I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Okay, you're going to see Martha say the same phrase twice, and it's the phrase, I know. Whenever someone tells you they know, they don't know. She quickly, this is the thing that happens in the delay. Anybody ever been in a delay? A delay of promise? A delay of the breakthrough? What do you do in the delay? There's two responses we see with Martha and Mary. Martha's is you can go into plastic buzzwords. Plastic phrases, but you're actually disconnecting from it in your heart. Sometimes we can use lots of great confessions, but our hearts are disengaged because of the pain of having to deal with the delay. Some of y'all haven't walked with the Lord yet. It's coming. She says, I know you can ask God whatever he wants and he'll give it to you. I love Jesus. He just stone cold. He goes, your brother will rise again. I know, she says it again, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. She has right theology about the resurrection of the dead. She knows there's a future day when the dead in Christ are going to rise first. She knows it. Jesus, stone cold, just looks in the face saying, honey, I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection isn't just coming. Resurrection's here. And I'm looking for you to get out of all your little buzzwords and plastic phrases. And I'm looking for real faith that pulls on my heart to pull me into this storyline. You want to do theologizing. I'm looking for faith. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he will live. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, it stops right there. Martha runs back into the city. And she grabs Mary, and it says Mary was sitting in the house. There's Mary, always sitting. And she says, the master has come, and he's looking for you. Now, we don't see Jesus asking for Mary. I think Martha hit a wall saying, all of my... You know, theologizing and all my nice talking isn't getting us anywhere, which means this. Jesus is looking her in the face saying, honey, you really missed Luke 10. Why don't you go back and learn how to sit before me? 
Why don't you go learn the secret Mary learned? Now get a hold of this. She goes and she gets Mary. Mary runs out to the very same spot and says the exact same phrase as Martha. Lord, but check this out, check this out. Mary said it from here. And she's going to say it with tears in her eyes. And do you know you can say the same phrase from two different places? One can be actually an accusation against God. The other one can be a statement of faith that doesn't understand what's going on. And Mary refused to get out of the tension of, God, I know who you are, but I don't understand why my brother's dead. It says that she fell down at his feet, she's weeping, and she says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. How did Jesus respond to that? He groaned in the spirit. We're getting in holy ground here when you start pulling a groan out of God. I want to tell you something. You can pull a groan out of God. You can stir up the bowels of his compassion the bowels of his love and the bowels of his power, not by just having all the right phrases. <laughs> he groaned in the spirit. What did that look like for Jesus to groan? And he goes, where have you laid him? <laughs> Where's he at? They go, come and see. And then we see the longest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Now we laugh about it. And it's called the shortest verse of the Bible. But I believe it was the holiest moment. And I believe it was closer to the 30 minutes. Because with Jesus surrounded by skeptics, critics, disciples, loved ones, strangers, around the world, everyone surrounding him, a storm came out of the Son of God's eyes. A storm of tears. What does that say about God that God weeps? Why didn't Jesus just translate to the resurrection of Lazarus? Why did he get down into the valley looking for something to bring forth up into the resurrection season? Jesus wept. He wept with his friends. He wept. He felt it wasn't just some robotic thing to him. He was actually connected to the storyline of his friends and to the storyline of Mary, and it cut him. It cut him. Jesus wept. He is the vulnerable God. He's the God who weeps with us to feel us, but the tears are going to become the seedbed of resurrection. The tears are going to become the seedbed of resurrection. Jesus wept. I could talk on that. I could literally do a message on that verse. And now he gets done weeping and everybody has their commentary about what he's doing. Look at how much he loved him. Other people said, why didn't he get here earlier? Everybody's got commentary. And then Jesus starts, he dries his tears, still groaning in the spirit, and he comes to the tomb. He says, roll away the stone. And then Martha, get a hold of this. Now we get to see faith-filled Martha come up to the front. Because this is what happens in the Luke 10. When you learn how to wait, everybody say, learn how to wait. Learn how to wait. We live in a McDonald's drive through convenience-driven generation. And Mary learned how to wait in the waiting room. To get called into the doctor's office. Martha tried to storm into the doctor's office. And she didn't have equity in the waiting room. Hear me. He says roll away the stone. Martha goes Jesus. He stinks by now. Thought you had lots of big phrases earlier honey. Actually I don't believe. I'm just hiding behind all my Bible verses. I'm just hiding behind my bumper stickers because I actually don't believe you. He goes, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? They rolled away the stone 
And he goes, Lazarus. It's his, he goes, first of all, he goes, Father, I thank you that you hear me. You always hear me. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man who had been dead for four days walks out of a tomb. Because Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. That was the second time. You know what it says in, in John 11? I love this. It says in John 11, it was talking about the lineup, Lazarus, Martha. And it says, and it was that Mary who anointed Jesus with, his, with her fragrant oil. Do you know oil gets produced in the crushing? You know oil gets produced in the crushing. She gained something in God right there. Let's fast forward to the third time. This is why I love Mary of Bethany. Turn with me to Mark 14. Are y'all okay? Mark 14. We're now going to see the last time I'm married. You know why I love Mary? People ask me all the time, who's your hero in the Bible? Outside of Jesus, of course. I go, it's Mary of Bethany. That little girl is my hero. Every time we see her, Jesus is defending her. We were singing earlier, this is how I fight my battles. I don't know about you, but I want to get Jesus fighting my battles. If you See, this is the thing. Mary only said one phrase in Scripture. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. In Luke 10, all she did was look at Jesus and listen to him, and he fought her battles. And then he's going to fight her battles in the last encounter. It's Mark 14. It's about two days before Jesus is going to be crucified. It's Passion Week. And Jerusalem is hostile. Jerusalem is weighing on Jesus' soul. And he goes, I got to get out of here. These jokers are making me sick. He goes, it's too hectic in Jerusalem. He goes to Bethany. And he's sitting at the house of Simon the leper in Mark 14. And it says that a woman came. Y'all with me? It says that a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she came and she broke the flask and she poured it upon his head, but there were some who were indignant among themselves. We know that these were disciples. And they go, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It could have been sold and given to the poor. And they began to criticize her sharply. Jesus breaks in and fights her battles. Says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. He goes, you always have the poor, but you don't always have me. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Jesus fought her battles. Most scholars believe that that costly oil was worth around $30,000. Some scholars have said this would have been her parents' inheritance to her that would speak of her future livelihood and care and comfort for her future. This girl breaks into a room. She's breaking 10 social protocols. She breaks into the room. She breaks the flask and she begins to pour it all over Jesus' head, down his body, all over his body, and she begins to lather him in this oil, this costly oil. And as soon as she does, all the disciples start manifesting. All the disciples, the disciples who were jockeying over who's going to sit at his right, who's going to sit at his left, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to be the greatest. And she says, I could care less about any of that stuff. The Son of God is here. And I want to love him with my life. Don't give me plastic. Sh she breaks through the noise and the chaos around Jesus. And she takes her whole future and she breaks it over Jesus. Costly sacrifice. Costly love. Costly worship. 
ever, the church, religious, will always look at something and call it a waste. What a waste. You know what you could have done with that money? Some of you look at your skill sets and you want to spend more time in prayer. You know what you could do with that gifting and skill set? People look at your life like a waste. You could have done more. You could have given more. You could have had more. What a waste. What a waste. What a waste. You're going to waste your life on something. Do you know when you stand before Jesus one of these days, he's going to ask you a simple question. Where did you waste your life? Because it's going to be poured out somewhere. They criticized her sharply. The religious spirit will always criticize extravagant worship and love. And Jesus looks him in the face. He, he's just sitting there and they just take their shots at her. And then Jesus speaks and he asks the core question, what is it about what she's done that's causing you to manifest? Why are you troubling her? What she's done is good work. Leave her alone. And then Jesus says this. None of you guys can get it through your skulls that I'm actually going to die. Because you're waiting for a Messiah that's going to kill Rome and establish Israel as chief among the nations. I've been telling you jokers for six months I'm going to die. And none of y'all can get it through your thick skulls. She's anointed my body for burial. Come on, come on, come on. She's prepared me for the thing that none of y'all can understand. Which means this. Not only was she moving in extravagant love. She was moving in revelation. Yeah, come on. She was moving in revelation. Of the offensive nature of the Messiah. A suffering Messiah. A suffering Messiah. No Jew could get their heads around that mentality. A suffering Messiah. Messiahs don't suffer. They inflict suffering. And she said, not only do I love you and I see how you're coming, I'm going to take my life and prepare you for it. And he goes... What this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Do you know what that tells me? That little acts in this age. Do you know that in the book of Acts, they're going to give a lot more money than her. They're going to be a lot more gifts. A lot more money that's going to flow in. But this is the thing about Mary. She did it before it was popular. She saw him before everybody else did. And there's something about getting in on a stock when it's two cents a share. I don't know about you, but Jesus said this. Wherever this gospel is preached, you know what he's saying, guys? You know, we'll never hear another word about Mary Bethany. She'll never have a healing ministry, an apostolic ministry. We'll never hear of her doing one more thing in Scripture. But she got something even greater. Jesus said, guys, you're going to go preach the gospel in all the earth. And when you proclaim Jesus came, died, resurrected, and is coming again, when you proclaim that, people go, well, what does a life look like that's been impacted by the gospel? Tell this story. Tell this story. Because to a person who has been impacted by the gospel, they give it all. They waste it all. It's the wasted life at the feet of Jesus. This is the thing I love about Mary. You may never be known. Some of you might have 10 followers on Instagram. You can be absolutely not known in this age. And you can get an eternal memorial in heaven. Little acts, choices that you make with your life can live forever in heaven. 
It's not about the man of God on the stage or that big anointed person, but it's about sacrificial love in silence, in weakness, in quiet when nobody sees it. That's the stuff that moves heaven. That's the stuff that moves heaven. He's delivering us from stages and he's awakening the power of a sacrificial life. I want to invite you all to stand right now. That's what I'm going after, God. I want the memorial. I want a life that screams forever. I didn't mean to go into this this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit took me here. I haven't preached this message in probably six to nine months. And I wasn't monotonously thinking about it until I got into this. Which means I believe this was for you. You got to learn how to do Luke 10. That will prepare you for hours of delay. That will produce the oil that you will pour at his feet. It all begins with a little girl that nobody knew about that moved the son of God. I've told Jesus, I want to be your Bethany. I want to be your getaway, Jesus. <laughs> I want to be your Mary. <laughs> Scholars say that that oil, Jesus would have still been smelling it on his body when he was on the cross. <clears throat> just open up your hands. I just want to pray for the revelation of the beauty of this man. Whatever, everybody has alabaster flask of very costly oil. You have a little flask and the Lord's saying, I want that. I just get lost in me. God, I pray right now for the revelation of the worth of Jesus. For the revelation of the value of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would teach us how to do Luke 10. God, I, I'll confess it. God, I, I get so busy, so distracted, so anxious. I live crisis to crisis. I'm waiting for the next text or the next email or the next post on social media. And I get distracted, Jesus. Help me come out of the swirl of distraction. I want to hear your word. I didn't have time to go into it. I'll do it next time. But in Luke 11, Jesus, it was Jesus' life of one thing that produced the disciples to ask him, teach us to pray. They were watching him do it. I want to be a man of one thing. The Lord told me this. If you go after one thing, you get everything. But if you go after everything, you get nothing. Nothing. 